Episode 3, Fire and Blood. Hello, and welcome to our latest episode of Discourse of the Three Kingdoms. This week, Jude and I are being joined by someone who's been part of the online Three Kingdom community for even longer than us. Kat, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, my name's Kat, and I've been part of uh, the uh, online discourse for uh, 21 years which is odd since I'm 25 years old, as we all know. Um, I have a master's degree from Tsinghua University uh, in Beijing. I lived in Beijing and Shanghai for a few years. And my cat is named after someone who you haven't met in the novel yet and who historically amazing in the novel, an idiot. Um, and I look forward to talking about people who are idiots in the novel. Plenty of people here in this chapter. <laughs> yes, we'll have to have you back when he appears um, in an episode. Oh, you will. I'm going to be so mad. It's going to be great. Excellent. We look forward to that. So since our last episode, looking at chapter two, you've been able to experience two bonus episodes, but that means that chapter two was quite a long time ago. So just in case you've forgotten what happened, uh, that episode ended with Heejin plotting to remove the eunuchs and Sao Sao offering some advice. Jude, can you give us an overview of chapter three before we begin? When we left the novel last, the turbans had been defeated by the Han Imperial forces and the volunteers, but peace would not set on the land as corruption continued. Emperor Ling's death sparked division at court with the Her family, seizing control against their court opponents. Her Jin, backed by Yon Xiao and Cao Cao, plots to remove the eunuchs, but is hesitant. In this chapter, Her Jin summons the armies, including disloyal Dong Zhe, against warnings of his council. The eunuchs decide to kill Her Jin, who ignores the concerns of his advisers and walks into a trap. Her Jin's officers respond with violence to his death, burning the palace gates, slaughtering every eunuch, and sending the imperial family into flight. The imperial princes return, but Dong Zhe had arrived with the troops and is not impressed by the emperor. Building his strength, Dong Zhuo seeks to depose the emperor, but when Ding Yon opposes, he turns to Ding Yon's mighty adopted son, Lu Bu, to get rid of the problem in exchange for a great horse. Excellent. So that's quite a lot for us to discuss. So let's start by thinking about He Jin versus the eunuchs, which is our first theme. So our chapter two ended, we've just said, with Cao Cao giving He Jin some advice. How important was Cao Cao's advice in history? Not at all. What advice? <laughs> well, the, co the comment about the eunuchs may have been apocryphal and we don't know who it was to. He Cao Cao was not part of He Jin's circle. He was a friend of Yon Shao, but at this point he was just a lowly colonel. I don't know that he even would have been there. Yeah, he was vaguely around the capital rather than... When we talked in the first two chapters, Liu Bei was running around doing fighting all these battles he was not a part of. It's now Cao Cao's turn. So we're saying that in the past, Liu Bei got credit for things that he didn't deserve, and now it's the turn of Cao Cao. Yeah. I guess we'll have to stop giving Liu Bei quite so much abuse for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll stay out of this one. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, Kat is, uh, you, you'd consider yourself a South South fan, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. I'm those obnoxious American South South fans. Some um, of our fans won't yet know why being a South South fan is somewhat controversial. Maybe we'll get you <laughs> back on to try and defend him when he does the indefensible in a few chapters time. Absolutely, though it's almost cool now to like him. So Yeah, yeah he's a very uh, popular character. I want to pop in about something here. I don't think it's something that can be discussed enough, but um, I want to talk about why the eunuchs here are considered so bad. You know, I think what you see is normally you're, you're going to see this sense of, you know, the eunuchs, they were decadent and, and, and frivolous and they, they built themselves mansions and, and did all of these, you know, shallow things. And, you know, they're friends with the empress and, and uh, to me, That's it's awful, it's, isn't it? Being friends oh, with the uh, empress. Well, yeah. Um, so it's not a 
a a coincidence, at least I don't think it's a coincidence, that these depraved eunuchs are also the ones who are men who were castrated. Um, w- when you see the way the role of how eunuchs are 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 given these roles in the downfall of whichever dynasty, because China's dynasties collapsed more than once, but there is definitely a it's an old adage in Chinese historical texts. Uh, Chinese historical texts tend to have a lot of morals in them, you know, instead of just facts. Uh, so there's always a lesson you'll find in, in even the historical texts, much less, obviously, the novel. Um, but it, you'll see this theme of how when women have control over government, it's everyone's downfall because they're, you know, decadent and shallow and trying to get their family in power. Uh, and and the same thing with the eunuchs. Uh, just th- just going to throw that out there, that that's an important an important theme of how gender affects someone's uh, ability to rule or their honor in uh, in Chinese tales. Okay, so so what you're saying is is very clear in this chapter that the eunuchs are presented as the villains, that they are people who should not be involved in politics. The novel was written with a very clear uh, bias, saying that everything goes wrong because I, did you use the phrase unnatural beings? Um, there's only a phrase that is used about eunuchs that these unnatural beings who've got no place in politics um, are getting involved and therefore things go wrong and you're saying that that's not true that's not fair that that is uh the way they're being presented because it fits in with a historical um historical narrative that doesn't like eunuchs yeah um i will say we can't know exactly what these eunuchs were doing and what they were like because um history has recorded them as mainly being you know Uh, in line with not being great. And I'm sure that they weren't great, but they probably weren't bad because they were eunuchs, um, because they have this role with the empress. It's almost like too suspiciously, uh, uh, too suspiciously consistent throughout these tales that it's somehow the eunuchs or the empress who are always messing things up or concubines. I so, find it difficult to believe they were any worse than than any other faction. So in, earlier we discussed when we were talking about the yellow turbans, how uh, Feng Zhu and Zhu Feng, um, confusingly similar names, were both part of the yellow turban rebellion and they were eunuchs. And so clearly there were people within the eunuchs who were trying to undermine the emperor. But you could absolutely say that about... Um, I mean, did He Jin really want to build up the emperor? If the emperor had become authoritative, he would have lost his power. So I, I, right. I, I'm dubious about whether it was in his, his best interest. He Jin's own family was actually uh, concerned about his loyalties and what his intentions were actually going to do. And uh, Kat's right. I mean, the novel's even worse than historical texts on this. Like, the historical texts will acknowledge there were just occasionally a good eunuch to be found or that women could be helpful in the in the uh and i air quote this right roles but the novel the novel really writes women out and i can it, think of one woman who we've not met yet who is presented positively whilst giving advice and even that's nuanced isn't it so the I- novel hates eunuchs and i mean really really hates eunuchs uh, one of the reasons why you see people vying for the position of em- Empress Dowager, that would be Empress He and Empress Dong, uh, is because when you have these young children, uh, it was said that it was really the Empress Dowager, the mother or the grand Empress Dowager, the grandmother who was in charge of politics at the time. Yeah, and the latter Han had a problem of Empress dying young, leaving either their own young children, like Emperor Ling had just done, or in quite a few cases, no children. So the Dowager would, put, unsurprisingly, pick a child who's old enough to survive, but not to reign for a long time. So you have so, Dowagers. Can I throw it out there then that perhaps the one of the reasons 
why women in being involved in politics had such a bad reputation was that because as you don't get an empress that's in charge it's always an empress dowager which means that they're in a situation where they're holding power in lieu of somebody else which means that there is a power struggle going on the dowager is fighting against um often not the eunuchs but maybe their her own family certainly against court officials which means that it's always going to be a time of instability the good times in the han dynasty was when there was a strong emperor and i'm not saying it couldn't have been a strong empress if the system had allowed for that but it was clear where the center of power lay absolutely i mean the fact that we see this is because they uh like you just said a second ago because it was not allowed for a female to be in power you're you're kind of uh one you know i'm not gonna say there might have been daughters who could have been in power but you know I'm, that would be a fantasy on my part you know just absolutely a, a fantasy but um you bring up a good point because when you look at I won't talk about uh, her too much, but, you know, Empress Wu Tian, the only Empress regent of China, where she in her own name became the title of emperor was actually a really stable time. So so it's like self-defeating. You have all of these these customs. I won't say men, but all these customs in place that are setting up an Empress Dowager to fail. Uh, and so you're doing it to the Empress Dowager or, you know, and then you're saying it's her fault. <laughs> I would say a lot of the Empress Dowagers, uh, Empress Dowager, there was one latter Han one that did well, uh, a Dowager Deng Sui, who uh, at one point the uh, uh, court just decided to let her rule and quietly ignored the Emperor who'd become of age. But generally, what you had in these situations were basically young women who suddenly got power, but they had to rely on eunuchs who were hated and their own relatives mm -hmm. who were going to be key supporters. And naturally, with your own relatives, they may be good men or they may be unreliable. And what they did would impact the way the dowager was seen. And the dowager was always going to be seen as important legitimate role but always with a bit of suspicion that if she seemed too powerful or if any scandal it was very very even at the best of circumstances it could be quite difficult for a dowager to sort of have a legitimate hold on power well yeah Dude. but i mean it's not like the empress dowager having her family in charge you know giving her family roles and power it's not like male rulers didn't do that. Oh, I mean, no, it wasn't. I didn't mean that as a criticism. It made completely logical sense. It was how the system was set up as well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. There's more it leaves them vulnerable, doesn't it? So take um, the dowager in this example, Empress. Um, he, she was in a position where, uh, because of the way China was set up, she couldn't run the armies. And so she was reliant on her two brothers, who she gave military authority to, to... Uh, run the armies and so she was all, uh, very reliant on them staying loyal to her in a way that perhaps male authority figures weren't because if they removed their son or stepson or brother-in-law or whoever it was from a position of authority they they probably had their own military force under their own private command which empress he wasn't in a position to have I think that's right, what you were just, getting at, wasn't it, Jude? Yes, that's what that's what I meant. Is they had to lean on their family because of the way mm -hmm. it was set up. How is Dowager her presented? They set her up as jealous to begin with. They set her up as killing the uh, concubine who gave birth to the other son, who might, you know, end up being emperor uh, in lieu of her child. Uh, that's another kind of a trope you see a lot about women's jealousy, poisoning each other and and, you know, vying for that kind of thing. And so that's how, you know, by by putting in a story about how she has committed some jealous act um, might have happened in history. Not sure. <laughs> um, it it's, it did happen in history. But the problem with that is it doesn't necessarily mean she actually killed the woman. It uh, it could, with complications of childbirth, and then sort of 
oh, the rival's dead. It must have been killed by the Empress, who's known to be jealous. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a very, there's a lot of tropes you get around harems, unfortunately. There's actually, um, I don't know if you know this, but some of, some of my friends um, and I developed the uh, Chinese historical trope bingo game where we have these bingo cards to fill out different tropes like, you know, jealous woman uh, poisons other, you know, woman who gave birth to another, you know, a ruler or politician vomits blood and dies. Uh, Leo Bai cries. Right, exactly. <laughs> Nothing wrong with crying. Nothing wrong with crying. Absolutely not. It's just we, we commented in a previous episode that Leo Bay always cries in the novel, but in history he's described as being someone that shows very little emotion. And so it's But um, he cries in history. Like, you know, when he cries when his thighs are fat. <laughs> I yeah. mean, every guy cries when their thighs are fat. Yeah, I mean, can't blame him. You know, we're totally in support of men showing their emotions. Though, now that point is, is you know, that was not considered, crying was considered heroic in ancient China. It was not considered uh, too emotional or, you know, um, that kind of thing. You cried like it's a weakness when... of the British stiffer upper lip that <laughs> right. uh, men crying has become a, a negative thing. I don't think that has been the case for most of history in most of the world. It's um, a weakness of British culture spreading. But that's definitely a conversation for another day. So um, what, what we've been doing there is discussing the relationship of the eunuchs and the empress. And one of the things that we've picked on, um, but let, let's make it explicit and let's think about it further, is that the, it seems very wrong that um, He Jin is on the side of the court officials rather on the side of the eunuchs and his sister, which is where you would naturally find him, um, you would presume. So in, in the novel, in this chapter, he's presented as arrogant with a sense of invulnerability. I, is that how he was like in history? No, actually. Uh, one of the criticisms of him in history is the opposite, whereas the novel, he's arrogant and a blunder head who won't listen to anyone. The criticism of him in the historical text is he's too in awe of the eunuchs because of his lonely background, that he's indecisive and can't seize the moment because he he just looks at the glamour and the rank of the eunuchs and it holds him back, which is quite an interesting switch around. Yeah, um, I wouldn't call myself a Hudson apologist um, by any means, but I do think that he uh, the situation he found himself in with everything kind of collapsing around him. And, you know, he's like, I, I am the son of a butcher. <laughs> um, but, you know, that he did have all of this power put on him. Uh, he had two sides tugging on him. And I think, you know, he, as opposed to just kind of necessarily being arrogant, wanting power for himself and his side, I think he might have been legitimately trying to keep the empire from falling apart. Interesting. So if he's trying to keep the emperor from empire from falling apart, which I agree with you, why do you think he thought that getting rid of the eunuchs was a good idea? Based on the novel and what's written in history, we do see the eunuchs building their mansions and and corrupting everything and uh, essentially, or not even essentially, but they say it straight out, causing the Yellow Turban Rebellion. So you, of course, you'd want to get rid of the eunuchs. I think one thing that sort of strikes me of he gets a lot of criticism for decisions he makes during this fight but i think this biggest mistake he made was actually picking this fight the gentry leaders like yon chow played on his sense of inferiority that if he did this one task if he used his authority and popularity with the troops to get rid of the eunuchs he would be a hero around the land he would be remembered as the guy who had got rid of this big threat to the Han. And it must had to be said, while the eunuchs were never, not usually a one cohesive group, but had several of their own little factions, there had been uh, moves against him by some eunuchs in the past. So that may so have been a case a of self preservation uh, to some degree. The eunuchs were 
um, trying to move against him, maybe scared of his authority. Some just a few there. eunuchs, just a few eunuchs. I just think a, a lot eunuchs. of them were quite happy to stick with Hajin until he tried to kill them. Yes. But was, there was even that uh, eunuch who helped Hajin escape, uh, Go, Go Shang. Yes, so that's really helpful to remember, isn't it? That not every eunuch were working towards the same goals. Just as it's important to remember that not every member of the nobility were working together, there would have been different factions in each subgroup who would have had different ideas of what was best. Okay, so we've got these two sides opposing each other, and in this chapter, we see them go to war. Now, I think it's fair to say both sides lose. Um, Heijin dies, almost all of the eunuchs die. Uh, does someone want to tell us what, what happened in history? What 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 went wrong for hey for team Hajin, uh base they tried a lot of different tactics to get the eunuchs out hey Jin for was rather reluctant to go for the whole storm the palace and kill them all approach because he wasn't decisive enough or he wasn't a complete psychopath take your pick. <laughs> yeah so they tried uh appointing uh anti-eunuch figures like yon chow into important investors to give roles to put pressure on by going, oh, look, we're talking to your servants. We're looking at where you got this money from. Sadly, he was a maniac. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Yon Shao had run escape lines against the eunuchs, and Wang Yun, had, uh, who was another key and pointy, had nearly been killed by the eunuchs, so may have been more than a tad bitter about that one. For some mm. reason, the eunuchs did not see this as a fair and above-board investigation by neutral parties. Uh, the other method which we'll get into in the next section was uh, sending out troops and summoning armies, which went, which did work in scaring the eunuchs, but may have also had something to do with that uh, one officer decided to set fire to a nearby town, which everyone in the capital could see during that night. That had an intimidating effect. But what went horribly wrong for Heijin was the eunuchs did actually resign. And then something leaked out. We don't quite know what, what. It could have been Yon Shao forging orders to the provinces to arrest their families. It could have been something Heijin was doing. But something leaked out and the eunuchs unresigned. Which forced Heijin, since the eunuchs were not going to resign it again, Heijin had to go to Daudu and go, I want to kill the eunuchs. And what did she say? She said no, unsurprisingly, given her track record. Uh, she still saw them as an important support arm to her. But the eunuchs either heard this and for some reason they decided to kill Heijin. Ah, would you read Heijin's poem for us? The Han will fall, its star told fate fulfilled. With feckless Hujin counseling the king, deaf to honest words, he seals his doom, quartered in the queen's receiving room. And whilst well, you can good. understand why they thought that that was a good idea, perhaps it wasn't wise, because ultimately I, I suggest Hujin was the restraining uh, factor on his faction. And when he died, it all went very, very wrong for the eunuchs. I mean, was that because of Hu Jin's faction or was that because Yuan Shao saw it as an opportunity to, uh, you know, raid the palace and kill 2000 people? Because I'm thinking Yuan Shao was trying to find a way to get an excuse to raid the palace and kill the eunuchs and 2000 other people. I think that's a legitimate question, to be honest, given he'd kept pushing for the methods he'd gone to had not been entirely above board, as I said, for orders or Oh yeah, for sure. I I do not think I do not think you know Yuan Shao, and maybe it's a reflection of how he was a part of the gentry. Um, you have to look at in terms of who are the eunuchs actually hurting with their actions. You know, uh, is there some farmer you know a thousand miles away uh, really getting hurt by the actions of the eunuchs, or is it going to be the gentry living in in you know in a proximity or otherwise connected to the uh to the politics in such a way uh but what i'm getting is i don't think yuan shao was going to leave the capital with the eunuchs alive no i don't think so either. though i would say 
What see you looks are dead. What we're about to see is a land of peace and harmony of all problems solved, Kat. So stop being so cynical about right, the gentry's right. motives. <laughs> Problem solved. Gentry, always looking out for the people. I'm sure that's how it worked in history. I'm sure, th- I'm sure that's true. This was not the first attempt by the gentry to kill the eunuchs. What had worked last time was they killed the leaders of the uh, gentry faction. It settled down, and then later they purged some more gentry fac members. The problem with this time was a the gentry remembered what happened last time, so they weren't going to f- go. Oh, it's fine. This prom- this promise that no one else will be touched will work completely. We'll, we'll be fine. They didn't believe that. And another issue was that usually the regent marshals had not bothered with the army under their command. They hadn't dared to do a few appointments. The soldiers didn't really care about the regent marshals. There. But Hadrian was unusual in that he took personal care of his soldiers. And this time, the soldiers were angry and out for blood. They mm-hmm. saw his head and rioted the soldiers had a great personal loyalty to him it's remarked on a few times i guess they saw someone like them succeed and that maybe that was a bought out loyalty or maybe he just genuinely cared for them and and had made decisions to make their lives better the records aren't entirely clear but you do get the sense that the northern army owed him a great deal of personal loyalty which as you say was unusual yeah it always amuses me that the reason Gentry turned to Hadrian was they saw that the army was loyal to them. They remembered that the last attempted coup had failed because the army deserted mm-hmm. when a famous commander was nearby. Oh, did you say a famous commander nearby? Yeah, I'm sure this will have no relevance whatsoever. I stopped reading after part one. Well, uh, there was that guy Duong, uh, there was that guy Dong Vuo who might have had something to do with the the fall of the Han dynasty not sure yes so that's our that's our next theme so shall we move on yeah sure seems like a good idea uh, so ju- just to help us segue in uh after Hejin dies and Yun Shu sets fire to the gates and it all goes very wrong the emperor um ends up having to flee the court and ends up in the middle of nowhere, and in comes someone called Dong Zhuo. Um, now, what was he doing near the court in the first place? So Dong, Dong Zhuo and some of the other outer generals who were keeping the borders, uh, you know, safe from the barbarians, uh, were brought in in order to intimidate uh, the eunuchs, right? everything's in disarray. Everything is absolutely out of control. So there's like a, a vacuum, a power vacuum there. And uh, I think he just sees, uh, he sees an opportunity or who knows, maybe a, maybe a duty, I, you know, um, to go in there and seize power and decide who the emperor is and, you know, et cetera. It does rather feel like using a sledgehammer to break a walnut, doesn't it? In terms of Hejian had the Northern Army, pretty much the only military force in the capital. He was more than capable of dealing with the eunuchs. But he then summons all of the regional uh, armies to come and intimidate the eunuchs further. And it all goes a little bit wrong because when Hejian dies, there's suddenly this vacuum of power. And, and he can't have predicted that. He didn't think he was going to die. But when he dies, there's this vacuum of power and someone has to fill it, and um, it becomes this guy, Dong Zhuo. What do you think of Hergin's decision, Jude? It is possibly the, apart from losing when actually losing and getting killed, it is possibly when everyone thought Hergin really should be winning this because he had the army. It's this decision to call him Dong Zhuo that really drives a nail in Hergin's reputation. And the, the decision itself to summon outside forces was opposed by some of his advisors. It didn't lead to the mass resignations the novel went for, but there were one or two that did go, right, that's it, I'm out, this is just going to be a disaster. Mm-hmm. But Hindsight's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. And we can see in hindsight how bad an idea it was, yeah. but at the time, yeah. there weren't the mass objections to it, so it's unfair to give him too much blame 
for it. I should also uh, point out Yon Chao also advised this as a course of action. Yes. Somehow Yon Chao doesn't quite get the same amount of blame that Ejin does for that one. That's because when people think of Yon Chao, they think of something that happens much later, and he, he gets lots of blame for that instead. So, and Yon Chao uh, gets seen as de- decisive in this as well. He He's does. sort of the heroic, thrusting figure of action. That is true. So now we're there. Um, how did Don Juo seize your seize power? When he got to the capital, uh, historically he only had about three thousand troops. His core companions he'd brought from the frontier. He he couldn't bring an entire army with him. That would cause too many questions. But he could bring his loyalists with him. And when he saw the capital water in flames and apparently not overly impressed by this. He marched in, discovered what had been going on. Then after helping put out the fires, there was a lot of uncertainty. And so what does he do next? Uh, when the emperor and cavalcade come back, uh, he has a conf- confrontation with that we'll get into, I think, in the next section. But uh, while things are uncertain, he sends his, some of his men out of the city during the night. And then they come back the next day with fresh banners looking like reinforcements. And with the Northern Army now leaderless, they see a famed commander who's constantly getting reinforcements and they go to him. So Dong Zhou becomes the biggest military power in the city. Yes. So moment of genius, to be fair, faking that he's getting more and more troops joining him is strategically brilliant. Um but I think I just wanted to pick up on the fact that I think Don Zhuo works out something else here. He realises that whoever's in possession of the emperor is the person who's going to fill the vacuum. So gaining more men is helpful, but he confronts the emperor before the emperor re-enters the city, doesn't he? So the emperor re-enters the city under Don Zhuo's um, protection, which then means he's legitimises himself as being seen as the protection figure to the emperor, which then combined with the fact that he's in a strong military position, uh, leaves him uh, as filling that vacuum. You, you, you have to keep in mind that being on the borders, Dong Zhuo was one of the, uh, you know, as opposed to the, uh, uh, the military leaders in the interior of, of the, the, the empire who, who did get, some experience from fighting, you know, the yellow turbans. Uh, Dong Zhuo was out there for his entire career fighting like the Xianbei or, you know, other other uh, nomadic forces who were constantly trying to uh, get past the borders or, you know. Uh, so he was a, uh, I don't want to say a real military leader, but he was I think far- you can say that. Compared yeah, to okay. Yuan Shao, for example, he, he yeah. actually was a real military leader. Right, exactly. So he had- he had um, had the experience, and I I think other people might have known that he had the experience. However, at the same time, those types of generals had the reputation of almost like being barbarians themselves, um, being outsiders. Um, and uh, who knows if maybe they're right? <laughs> I think that's particularly interesting when it comes to uh, Dong Zhuo himself, because he came from. Uh, the most western province of China, which was constantly in danger of being overrun by uh, the Xianbei. And various times in the Han Dynasty's history, there had been talk of just giving up on that province, just just letting it go, because it's not worth the money, not worth the expenditure to keep uh, keep investing in it. And that meant that people from that province, as I said, including Dong Zhuo, were not really seen as properly Chinese. And from his perspective, um, he probably thought that the only way to secure his home, to make sure it stayed part of the Han Dynasty, was to seize power himself. And I do think that that's a motivation uh, that we can see for Don Zhuo's actions in terms of seizing power that I think is underappreciated and perhaps gives us some understanding of why he, at this stage he was behaving how he did. Now, later on, it's harder to defend his actions. But at this point, I can see why he wants to gain authority and it might not be for entirely selfish reasons. I I think 
that one of the things the novel does, and there's a change from earlier fiction, is that it makes Dong Zhou a incompetent. The one campaign we've seen him in is the Yellow Turban one, where he does badly and has to be rescued, and it expressly links him with the eunuchs and that he'd pretty much been promoted due to bribery and corruption. Right. But historically, as you've both mentioned, he was a leading general. He fought over 100 battles in the north. He was a skilled archer, very strong. Uh, was... You mean he wasn't just really, really fat like the Koei games present him as? Yeah. Uh, novel also presents him as fat. History <laughs> also presents him as fat. So there's been fat shaming for 2,000 years here. Look, the fat will later become a really, really useful guide to the cost of living. You're right. <laughs> Doesn't he, I, I might be wrong here, but doesn't he put on weight once he arrives at the court? My understanding is that when he arrives at court, he's in pretty good shape and then he enjoys a luxurious living and um, his good lifestyle of being an archer and stuff goes out the window because he's eating too much food and not doing enough exercise. Is that is that fair? That's kind of the impression I got, actually, but I think it's more he, I think he may have always been large and then grown rather corpulent over time. But sort of an earlier fiction, the Pringwa, uh, he that's it, it starts with him fat, but it, he can still run faster than a horse. He's a mighty warrior. He can run but, faster than a horse. Yeah. I feel like that might be an exaggeration in the sources. Yeah. I, I, it was trying to present him as a mighty champion, even if he's evil. But, but I understand novel. what you're getting at. He, he he was in the sources. He is a military man who is competent. And um, I, I would suggest at the point he comes into the capital, there are maybe three, three other generals in China that have a standing similar to him. Huang Fu Song, who we've mentioned a few times, maybe Sun Jian, and a guy called Ding Yun, who we're going to. I come up to in a in a few moments' time, but they're really the only three that have got the same kind of standing as as Dong Zhou, aren't they? Yeah, I think as a general from a frontier, where he would have been looked down on for being a frontiersman, there were insults that possibly were written after he he <laughs> become a tyrant, but there were insults about his possible lineage. Also, as a general, he would have been aware that being a Han general was a bit of a risky business. There were plenty of successful generals who'd been jailed, executed, fallen into disgrace. Oh, well, that's how you know someone's a hero in Chinese history. And uh, let's just discuss what happened to the Imperial boys. But they and the eunuchs fl flee the capital, what with it being on fire, troops rampaging, and all such. It's a reasonable response, isn't it? I think if yeah. I was... If my home was on fire, running away probably would be my first reaction. <laughs> and while Daldra Herg ends up with the uh, attacking forces, the, the Emperor and his younger brother are with the eunuchs as they f try to flee to safety. Eventually, uh, Luzi does kind of spot that they're cut missing and sends a posse after them. Well, when the eunuchs are caught up to, the uh, eunuchs... Uh, are either killed or they drown with uh, some of the leading eunuchs urging the emperors to take care of themselves and warning that this will lead to chaos. When it's one of my favorite tropes uh, yeah. in, in Chinese, you know, going back to ancient Chinese uh, history trope bingo uh, is when uh, like a force or a group of people are so afraid that they jump into the river and drown. So um, the emperor and his brother, um, are fleeing the capital. Um, the eunuchs have kind of left them. They are they alone in the wild? They are in the novel, aren't they? Is that is that how it worked in history? That's a rather lovely image of fireflies leading them to safety, and that actually they would follow the fireflies to refuge. I think the you know the fireflies kind of goes to show. So we we do see later that you know Emperor Xian is portrayed as the more competent between the two, and and something I think that has kind of forgotten a lot of the time in the more modern like communist uh, interpretation or the more modern Western you know interpretations of of the novel 
is this idea of the celestial properties of the, you know, the son of heaven. And so I feel like even though clearly Dong Zhuo put this kid on as a puppet, you know, Luo Guanzhong is still going to want to show that he's probably still actually the chosen son of heaven. And you can see it because, you know, they've got the fireflies, you have him being more competent. You know, you don't want to go so far as to say this emperor was a puppet. Yeah. Right. So although so in, the, novel the novel presents Dong Zhuo's decision to replace the emperor with his brother as a negative decision, it doesn't want to present the new emperor negatively because actually um, – for religious, for religious reasons, he needs to be seen as a legitimate emperor in his own right. That's what you're saying. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, religious, political, whatever. But yeah, he can't be, uh, Emperor Xian cannot be portrayed as a false emperor. Yeah, yeah I mean, so if you see it in the flight. It's the younger brother who's constantly urging, we need to move. Uh, oh, look, here's a refuge. Here's a... Where's the... Oh, the older brother who's meant to be the emperor and thus this figure of authority is constantly scared, is constantly sort of paralyzed with fear. It's the younger brother who gets into the refuge of the Sir family. So the emperor yeah. doesn't handle the situation well, but through the actions of his younger brother, they end up in a place of safe refuge and a force arrives. And is that good news or bad news for the emperor? On paper, it's good news. I mean, welcome home. It, it's going to be better than the farmer's cart they're in and all that. But the problem is, if you don't know who the army is and there's just been mass murders, you might be a bit sceptical that this might not be the welcome parade. The novel draws on the history in the reaction to the emperor's reaction to uh, this strange force, this Dong Zhou's forces. He's terrified. He's frightened. He says nothing, and what they can get out of him on the account is just garbled and unclear. But it's the younger brother who wants more, it shows leadership. Interesting, because it would have been tempting, or you might have thought that all of this was just propaganda from Dong Zhuo to justify putting a younger person on the throne who might be able to control easier. But um, maybe, maybe he was able to build on stuff that was already there. Yeah, it's... I think it's hard to tell whether it's sort of complete propaganda like Dong Zhou and really successfully has knitted together this tale of to justify, sorry, sort of justify the changes he makes. You know, I'm not sure he manages to successfully justify it, yeah, but he manages but he, to come up with an excuse, doesn't he? Yeah, the idea that sort of, we get this kind of weird image of both that sort of Dong Zhou's plan is completely illegitimate and wrong, but also like, but it's the right change of emperor in that one yeah. son is weak, the other one turns it's clearly better suited. You, well, can't, right. you can't get that win miss fast. Like like what what I the part I was trying to get at in terms of you know this being propaganda, or you know is this just something that was added in order to make it look like like there was not this time during the Han Dynasty where it was ruled by this false emperor. Like, yeah, propaganda for, you know, less for like Dong Zhuo making this rational decision, but more like, well, clearly you see these two, which one is the son of heaven? It's this one. So I was just putting the rightful emperor, the, the, the heaven chosen emperor on the throne. And therefore, although Dong Zhuo's behavior isn't justified. He still doesn't have the right to make that decision. He still somehow, despite his bad motivations, is apt to, acting in accordance with heaven's will. Right. Is kind of what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. In terms of whether it's complete propaganda, uh, Carla Band does make the point that with the ages they're at, the, the Emperor Beyond might actually have just been fully aware of how dangerous this situation was. And probably quite traumatized the younger the younger kid sort of you know how young can be completely oblivious to the dangers they're in the naivety of youth it's a lot of propaganda and for us i suspect basically dong Zhou just said what he wanted i mean God, of course he's replacing an 18 year old who's about soon enough going to be old enough to rule with a nine a nine year old right yeah, I'm sure. Th I'm sure he had no self-interest in that at all. 
No, not at all. Clearly this, you know, nine-year-old genius. Um, um, let's get back to this this theme of Dong Zhuo seizing power. So he's, he's come up to the court um, and he's kept on having more of his men appear. So it looks like they are... Um, he looks like he's got a far bigger force than he has. Uh, and the Northern Army, who were following He Jin, are bereft, aren't they? They've lost their leader. So what do they do? Who who do they follow and who could they have followed? Not that many, actually. Both He, brother, he brothers were dead, so that left that side. There were a few people with military experience, but the Western Garden Army that Emperor Ling had tried to set up that had collapsed and been absorbed by Heijin. So the main rival militarily-wise seems to have been Ding Yon, who'd been given uh, security at the castle in the aftermath of the fires and the massacres. So would you and Xiao never an option for the Northern Army, do you think? It never really set him up as one. I think the issues he would have had was he was not the head of his family and there would, he can't set him self up above his uncle there's mm. also he kind of waited to see what was going to happen ah, interesting. so he was really decisive when he jim was the one that had to carry the consequences of it but the moment it falls on his shoulders he hesitates which um something we're going to see later so so it doesn't appear that anyone from within the he faction steps up and presents a credible option for the Northern Army to follow. We don't know why. So instead, they all defect um, en masse to supporting Don Zhuo, don't they? Yeah. I think one possibility about uh, why there wasn't more of a stepping up is, as well as basically every major political leader other than Yon Wei would seem to be dead at this point, is that those who are left have probably had quite a shock just imagine normal day yeah some violence happens at court it's n- that's not unknown but you've just seen the palace on fire a few days before you've been watching from the city as a town nearby have been set on fire by Han forces this and must have been a shock to everyone and the empress disappeared the jade seal's gone the the organs of government are in chaos and there's also something to be said about we're talking about an army, a, the professional army of China, which has been trained to, you know, in a military culture. And and the the guy who's marching in is one of the real generals who's really fought and really subdued wild, quote unquote, you know, people before. So there seems to me uh, there would be a certain attraction to Dong Zhuo uh, <laughs> as a military leader who could really put things under control. Uh, if not, you know, an admiration for him or just a fear. If, and if you're a soldier, Dong Zhou is known to treat his soldiers well. He built loyal. Comp- did, he would uh-huh. use the loyalty of his soldiers to avoid appointments he did not want to take because the Han court were worried that his soldiers were too loyal. If you're part of the Northern Army, why not join a guy who knows his guild general? You know he treats th- those under him well. And also, Yun Shao has just done something absolutely unhinged to the people you work for. I do wonder slightly whether the soldiers really cared about that, given they've just gone and set the palace on fire and looted it, which yes. is really a bad sign for how things are going to go when your own army does that to you. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so Dong Zhuo has seized power. The Northern Army are working with him. What happens next? Is he left completely unchallenged, or does anyone try to stand up to him? Well, doesn't Ding Yuan uh, challenge him? He does indeed. What does the novel tell us about Ding Yuan? Not that much, I think. Yeah, no, I think we're just supposed to think of him as like a, you know, he's a he's an imperial loyalist. He's loyal to the idea of, you know, the mandate of heaven and, and keeping the Han dynasty together because it's been for, you know, 400 years. And so he's, uh, so, so he's almost a plot Ding- device, isn't he? Although he's a historical figure, he's introduced in this chapter. He's killed in this chapter. We get given almost no information about him. So he's literally there, as you say, to represent an idea rather than being a, a genuine character. Right. Cause Dong Zhuo like has a, a banquet cause he's decided he wants to uh, change the emperor. 
how does he go about doing that? What, what's the banquet you were telling us about, Kat? Oh, right. Okay, so Dong Zhuo is going to do this in a banquet by being super scary and basically uh, spread the uh, word that he will kill anyone who uh, opposes him uh, during this banquet. Uh, this is indeed a plot device where Dong Zhuo has this banquet. People are drinking wine and, you know, then everything becomes serious. Uh, this is also on the Chinese bingo uh, card trope is the banquet. Um, and he says, we're going to change the emperor. And then this guy, Ding Yuan, is he's the only one who stands up in the in the name of the Han dynasty and and, you know, the empire uh, when everyone else is afraid of Dong Zhuo to to say we can't do this because the han has been together for 400 years and if you do this it's gonna you know ruin the glory so dia has some cajones but there may be a reason why he alone feels confident to stand up to dong zhuo uh, there is i should say one person who speaks after the banquet to sort of back up thing yon uh luji the uh commander who'd warned against dong zhuo arriving of oh. course. And we met him back in chapter one, didn't we? Because he was one of the commanders, one of the three commanders that fought against the Yellow Turbans. Lucy uh, says that while emperors had been dethroned before, uh, these were not the right circumstances to do it. Dong Zhou was no hero of old. He's newly arrived to court. And that any without, if it was not done in the right circumstances, it was an act of treason. Basically accusing Dong Zhuo of being a traitor, which, which he, he took as well as you'd expect. And as Kat says, he was he was wanting to dispose the emperor, which is difficult to defend. So uh, Lu Qi is not killed because um, he's too well regarded, but Dong Zhuo wants to kill Ding Yuan in the novel. Why doesn't he? It's just like a super scary guy behind him, right? <laughs> Uh, behind him is the scary guy of the three kingdoms, uh, Lu Bu. He's currently standing right behind Stephen and is scaring both me and Kat. <laughs> I'll fight him. Come on, let's go. Yeah, you fight him, I'll run the other way. <laughs> My money would be on Kat. I wouldn't fight her. Not for a second. Um, <laughs> so, Lu Bu is standing behind Ding Yun, um, and Dong Zhuo is going to kill him, and he changes his mind because he's scared of Lu Bu. And Dong Zhuo decides that there is one way to secure his position, and that's to recruit Lu Bu to his side, which is how the rest of this chapter goes. So how does he go about doing that in the novel? Well, Sorry. this is where Li, Li Su comes in. It is where Li Su comes in. What does Li Su say? Uh, he is a friend of, of Lu Bu, um, and he, he tells uh, Dong Zhuo that, you know, um, he's very brave, heroic, but not loyal necessarily, not smart necessarily. So if you give him cool stuff, he'll probably join you. And that's um, shocking because in the novel, uh, Lu Bu is presented as Ding Yun's adopted son, isn't he? And mm -hmm. so... That's very unfilial behavior. So we we know that that's bad, that the novel says that that isn't how he should behave. Um, but does Lee Su's plan work? No, it doesn't work. Dog Joe gets slain and we all go home. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> History would be very different. But no, that isn't what happens. Jude, what actually happened? Lee Su uh, persuades Dong Joe to depart with a gold pearls and a very, very lovely horse called Red Hair that can run across streams, never tires, basically the ultimate horse. He didn't have a Ferrari, so you get a red horse. When Lucy meets with Lu Bu, they chat a while. Lu Bu shows his discontent with his worthy master. And Lu Su gently leads him on to the idea that, with a, which will become a theme of the novel, that the wise man or the wise bird bird chooses its perch and so a wise man chooses his master and Dong Zhou just happens to be this wonderful guy who really adores Lu Bu and look at all these riches he just insisted Lu Su take to, to show his appreciation of Lu Bu and if Lu Bu could just 
happen to think of something that might help Dongsho, he would be most grateful. And after a while, Lu Bu comes up with a minor favour he can do for Dongsho. I kill his master, Ding Yon. Not just his master, his adopted father. Shocking. We're giving him a horse. Can I mention something about red hair? That's kind of fun. Please do. uh, Red hair was probably a Fergana horse, which is this horse that was from the Northwest um, that was said to have bled when it it was sweat blood. Um, This is actually because of a parasite. I think they they really do. Uh, There's a blood that happens when they sweat so so uh the thought is that red hair was a fergana horse and so in history how similar is these events to the way they're presented in the novel not at all and zilch not at all and zilch so how does Lu Bu end up on dong Zhuo's side instead of ding yun's side which rather sad for uh the han there's no mention of ding yun actually protesting dong Zhuo's actions it's more, he's the last barrier for Dong Zhou's plans. And so Dong Zhou reaches out to Lu Bu, who's not an adopted son, and Lu Bu kills Ding Yon in exchange for not a horse, but rank, position at government, that sort of thing, which we would all clear for. So Ding Yun wasn't a great champion of the Han Dynasty. Instead, he was just a run of the mill rival for Dong Zhou, who he wants rid of. Um, and Lu Bu kills him for him. Uh, uh, I think another trope I, I just want to talk about whilst we're on the topic of Dong Zhuo is the fact that Dong Zhuo is... So we, we've mentioned that he's presented as being fat and not particularly good at military stuff. He's also presented as being completely politically incompetent, and he get, uh, and we meet a trope that we will see throughout the novel where he has a strategist called Li Ru who he completely relies upon. Um someone want to say something about that and about the role of strategists in the novel? You know, it's almost like Dungeons and Dragons or something. Uh, when you when you when you parse not only the novel but kind of Chinese history too. I love you know, this comparison. <laughs> you know, it's what I was expecting. The, there are these different roles that people play. Like you have the strategist and you you know advisor, and you have the general, the warrior, and you have the leader. And uh, and and they're very segregated. They are, if you're good right. at being a leader, you're not good at being a strategist. And if you're good at being a strategist, you're not good at fighting. Right, exactly. So in this case, Dong Zhou is the mythically inept but tyrannical leader. Lu Bu is the mighty warrior. And we see this a bit in the chat. Ding Yon and Dong Zhou have a fight outside the city. And Lu Bu just charges Dong Zhou and the hot and Dong Zhou's experienced army just collapses in a second. Right. So it built him quite quite well, but Dong Lu Bu is going to be that bodyguard, the mighty muscle. Possibly not very bright or loyal, but like my, the novel very much separates the meatheads, the warriors, from the bookworms, the scholars who who come up with the advice, the polit- politics, the grand plans so it'll be though there'll be leaders will sort of set the tone of the regime but it'll be very much warriors and strategists that dictate the battles and the plots and and there's a cer- certain like conniving kind of uh personality too uh <laughs> that that fits in with the trope of the strategist there is a good character like, am i right in saying he's dong Zhuo's son-in-law yes yes in the novel in the novel yeah Oh, and then don't forget that Lu uh, Lu Bu decides to be um, decides to be uh, Dong Zhuo's adoptive son. So s- switches that around pre- pretty fast. Yeah, uh, if I He's was Dong Zhuo, I'm yeah. not sure I'd have accepted that based off of how the last, the, at the end of the last adopted father, I, right? Lu Bu is someone I would not want as my son. I do wonder whether it's actually would have even been possible to refuse her. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, I guess if he's standing there with two halberds, you're not going to say, no, I don't want to be hey, your dad. Hey, dad. Yeah. And look at this present I brought you. Look, it's still dripping with blood. Yes, that's a very fair point. 
Okay, so that brings us towards the end of the chapter. So uh, Dong Zhuo has killed Ding Yun. He is now in a position of almost unassailable authority. And again, he says, I want to change the emperor. Is anybody going to be willing to take a stand? Given the novel had to make up one opponent so far, you don't feel there's going to be much chance, but apparently, yes. Okay, so who does the novel present as the... uh, other person willing to make a stand yun shao yun shao and as hopefully you're getting used to every chapter ends with a poem and this chapter ends with yun shao challenging dong zhuo and ends with a poem about it cat would you do the honor of reading that poem you mean my favorite part is how they always end in a sentence that's like what happens next read on to find out absolutely Um, but it's Ding Yuan stood for honor and lost his life. Yuan Shao challenged Dong Zhuo and stood in peril. And what was Yuan Shao's fate? Well, you're going to have to read the next chapter of the novel and join us in our next episode in two weeks' time to find out. But for now, it's time for us to go. So, Kat, can we say a big thank you for joining us on this episode? Thank you for having me. I love you're- giving my opinions about things. You are awesome. Thank you for coming. <laughs> it was our pleasure to have you. And uh, in the meantime, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from me. Bye.